the, the cliques lead to bricks, I think is a great, um, I've seen that. I mean, even just, I did speaking before the Bible recap was a podcast. I would do speaking and some people would show up. Um, but now that there is all these people out there listening to the podcast, a lot more people show up. A lot more people come in person because they've heard me through their you know, AirPods. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. It's Carrie here. And man, if you're new, welcome. I hope you subscribe because we got a killer episode for you and an archive of just hundreds of episodes that I think you're really going to love. And today, I sit down with Tara Lee Cobble. You probably know her from her podcast. And uh, we're going to talk about digital discipleship, the journey to 350 million downloads, and a lot more. Today's episode is brought to you by my very first conference. It's called The Art of Leadership. Live. And if you're looking to level up your leadership, level up your church, I'm hosting it in Dallas, Texas from September 16th to 18th. It's the Art of Leadership Live. Space is very limited. This is going to be intimate and small, different from so many conferences you've been to. Secure your spot by visiting the Art of Leadership Live. And I look forward to hanging out with you in Dallas in September. And today's episode is brought to you by our partner, Belay. If you want to strike the work-life balance you deserve, just text my name, Carrie, to 55123. You'll receive a free download of Belay's ebook, Rise Up and Lead Well. Make sure you check that out. And now to my conversation with Tara Lee Cobb. Tara Lee, welcome. So happy to be here, Carrie. Yeah, it's great. Well, I want to go back. A few years because you kind of, we met in Atlanta in, I think it was 2019, wasn't it? It was. We did an event mm-hmm. together and you were just starting. At that point, it was sort of, you know, a lot of people hadn't heard of you and now, boom, mm-hmm. you know, one of the top podcasters in the world, et cetera. So I want you to reel back a little bit and just tell us how you got to the place that you are now. Wow. Well, in 2019, I think it was September or October. It was fall. I do remember that. Yeah. And uh, I, we, the Bible recap, the podcast that that I have now was nine or 10 months old at the time. We launched January 1st, 2019. And everything that I do with the Bible recap is to help people read, understand, and love God's word. I don't just want them to read it. I don't just want them to understand it. I want them to love it. And so everything is geared around that. And, um, prior to that, I had a ministry helping people study the Bible. And, uh, that was one of the ways that I came into contact with Grant Skeldon, who is, who invited both of us to that event, I believe, Uh um, at Buckhead Church there. And I was so excited to be in the room with you. Uh, I was so excited to hear you teach because I have been longtime listener of this podcast and, um, just, you've said so many things and I'm sure all of your listeners right now can attest so many things that have helped so many of us in ministry. And you actually said something on that day. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but you said something on that day that the Lord used in huge ways uh, in the months ahead as we approached 2020. Um, And uh, this is a little bit off topic, but you said um, you were challenging us, the people in the room, you were challenging us. What is something that you've always said no to uh, that, God is calling you to say now to, to kind of like, what are you changing? You're changing your no to a now. Like, what is that thing that you've always closed the door on that God's like, nope, we're going to, we're going to change things up here. And I had run a ministry called D group at that point for 10 years, a discipleship and Bible study group. We meet in homes, we meet in churches. um, And there were so many people who wanted us to have online groups as an option. And I was like, nope, we're not going to do it. Nope. This is about community. Nope, nope, nope. And that day, listening to you talk in fall of 2019, the Lord was like, online D group. So I went home, I gathered my team. I said, Carrie Newhoff said this thing, we're going to implement online D groups. And I asked my, uh, our, our administrator at the time, how long do you think it will take us to get this running? And she said, I think we can have it going, uh, beginning in March, 2020. <laughs> Sorry, I just got to laugh. <laughs> right? Wow. So we, thanks to you, that ministry stayed afloat during the time when the world shut down. Because the Lord used you uh, in that way, reached us, and we shifted the plan, and I changed my no to a now. And because of that, we have so many online tea groups around the world that are serving people in uh, places where there aren't churches, places where um, people are, you know, shut in and they can't they can't get out, or they have health issues and things like that. And so, just I would just want to say thank you, thanks for that. 
<laughs> that is news to me. You know, to be honest with you, I don't remember saying that. Now, that was five <laughs> years ago. But isn't that a, you know, and, and any preacher can relate to that. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, I worked hard. I remember the talk I gave that day. So it's not like mm-hmm. I have no memory of the day. I remember a lot of the people who are in the room. It was an amazing event. But sometimes you mm-hmm. have everything scripted out. I probably just said it. And maybe it was a prompting. Maybe it was lunch. I don't know. And God used it in powerful ways. Absolutely. Digital discipleship. So we mm-hmm. come out of the pandemic, everybody's talking about discipleship, 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 discipleship. And one of the pushbacks, even now in 2024, is, well, you can't do discipleship digitally. I'm like, maybe I should ask Tara Lee Cobble about that <laughs> and see what she has to say about oh, digital boy. discipleship. Yeah, go ahead. Open mic. I have been discipled so much online. Um, so much of my teaching, I'm, I've just to answer any questions anybody might have, including you, I've never been to seminary and, um, I don't learn well in a classroom setting. And so if I want to sit down and have a conversation with my pastor, um, depending on who my pastor is, there might be a lot of hoops to jump through for that. That might not be a possibility depending on his accessibility, depending on his boundaries around meeting with women. um, Just there are a lot of things that might prevent me from having that opportunity. And so what I have done is I have taken in a lot of content like your contact content and other podcasts and theology podcasts and podcast sermons. And that has absolutely discipled me. Um, Disciple means learner. That has yeah. Given me the ability to learn. Now, are those people my mentors? No, um, but absolutely, they have taught me in the ways of Jesus. And so, I don't know where I would be without digital discipleship. And so much of what I do is digital discipleship. You know, we have a podcast, we have a YouTube, um, and we hear stories all the time of lives, marriages, eternities being changed by how God has taken these resources. That, that are available to us in the world today and use them to, to amplify the gospel and the message of the kingdom. And so, man, if people can't learn about God through digital means, <laughs> like, I, I just don't, I'll never believe that because um, it's been, it's transformed my life. Wow. And I mean, mine too, in really powerful ways. And you're right, the ability, and you and I have the privilege now of connecting with people that we once only dreamed of connecting with right? Mm-hmm. And, but I want to go back a little bit. Okay. So D group survives the pandemic. What was your hesitation in moving these digital discipleship, these discipleship groups? What does the D stand for? Is it discipleship? D stands for discipleship. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So these mm-hmm. discipleship groups, what was the hesitancy you had in putting them online? Was it logistical? It's like, oh, that's a nightmare. Was it philosophical, theological? What was your it was more philosophical. Um, yeah. I had great people on my team that I knew could get us over the technological humps. Mm. Um, and I think one of the things about D Group that makes it unique is we are not connected to any specific church, and um, but we love we want to be a tool in the hands of the local church. We love to partner with local churches and serve them. We build out this incredibly intense discipleship program where we do a deep dive into a book of the Bible for 12 weeks at a time. And there is scripture memory and there are weekly challenges and there are videos that we send out to the groups every week. And we want those to serve the local church in the way that, I mean, we have a a team of like uh, 10 people and 20 volunteers, and most ch- most churches can't staff that to build out a discipleship mm. program, you know? And so we're writing the curriculum, we're doing all these things, we're vetting all these uh, leaders. We, we have the leaders go through a training program, and we're training the leaders individually, and we want this to serve the local church, not take away from the local church. We want it to serve the local church. And so um, my thought is, if people have something that is available to them in their homes, they never have to leave their homes for, we are uh, in some ways getting in the way of what we wanted to do, and which is to push people back into community in their local spaces, in their towns, to if they aren't a part of a church, to get them in the church. Um, but what we've kind of found in this is that that is still happening. People, if they aren't in a church and they join D Group, they hear us regularly encourage them, find a church, find a local church, plug in. And then they're talking with each other and hearing like, oh, I, you know, I, here's what I love about my church. And 
you're, oh, I heard about a church that's in your area that's, you know, because there may be, we have people in different continents. There's one D group that I think has people from four different continents represented in their weekly meetings. And um, we have, you know, over 300 D groups around the world. And um, a lot of them are online, but people are being driven to the church through this online means, as I'm sure a lot of people who have online church services have seen happen. You know, they're watching, they're vetting the service online first, and then they know what to expect when they go and they show up. So we're having the same thing happen uh, with D Group, but I really was just afraid that it was going to keep pe- be an excuse for people not to be in the church. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Because I mean, five years later, six years later, people are still having that conversation in their mm-hmm. church. What's your view now? I mean, I quote him a lot. Frank Blank, Blake said, I heard him say this years ago, Home Depot. He was the former uh, chairperson, CEO of, of Home Depot. I think he's on the board now. And, you know, it was, well, do you have a website? Because if you have a website, people aren't going to come in the store. And his tagline was clicks lead to bricks, that the more clicks you have, the more people actually walk through the store. So I've been sort of sharing that in the church space, not always getting a very receptive audience to that message. What is your thought on that now? How has your viewpoint shifted or changed? So much, so, so much. And it's, uh, I'm so happy to have been wrong. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, how great to learn something new and to realize you were wrong. Uh, I'm sad I was wrong for so long, but I'm glad that the Lord uh, used you to to turn my understanding of that at a time when it really was truly pivotal. Um, but yeah, the, the clicks lead to bricks, I think is a great, um, I've seen that. I mean, even just, I did speaking before the Bible recap was a podcast. I would do speaking and some people would show up. Um but now that there is all these people out there listening to the podcast, a lot more people show up. A lot more people come in person because they have heard me through their, you know, AirPods. Totally. And I can relate to that. I mean, you know, the, 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 the online audience is so much bigger. So I know we don't always play this game. You may not want to do it because it's not the metrics that we live in and die by. But I'd love to ask the question and I'd love an answer if you're open because I think people don't realize how big online can be. So you, it's you and a small team. What's your digital footprint and reach today on the various channels? And feel free to share all the numbers. Um, I am really bad at this. Okay. <laughs> so I'll tell you um, the most recent numbers that I heard, which may or may not be out of date. Um, the last I heard, we had something in the range of 350 million downloads. Um in a little over five years. And um, we launched our YouTube January of last year. And we did the math on it. I don't remember how many hours it was, but I divided it by um, the number of hours in a year. And I was like, we've been listened to uh, something like 230 years of list of Years of views. listening. Yeah. <laughs> years and, of um, listening. I mean, most so, people look at their minutes watched, right? You're yeah. like years of listening. Okay. Yeah. So that's our YouTube is, I think, 230 years uh, of listening. And um, and then, you know, just so grateful. Like can't, can't even, because here's the thing, and you know this, and every listener out there knows this, uh, those numbers represent people. Like th- those, aren't, those aren't just random numbers. It's not just hours and downloads. It's souls and individuals and their stories. And those are people who want to read the Bible. Those are people who, like, I- I'm not, uh, you know, out there talking about makeup. You know, I love to talk about, you know, like yeah. these are people who like want to read the Bible, who want to engage with the living God. And that is so crazy to me because when I started, when I launched January 1st, 2019, my prayer my big pipe dream, you know, D group at that point was, I think about 1200 people. And I think, uh, I thought if I can get a quarter of the people, I, I didn't have any idea that people outside of D group would listen to my podcast. They were my audience. Right. My prayer was that 300 people would listen. And th- th- like, I was like, if I can get a quarter of D group to read the Bible with me, how great would that be? You know? Um, so that's yeah. exceptional, you know, and that is how people think it's like, well, 1200 is mm-hmm. a lot of people. We'll get a, a third of them, a quarter of them listening, and it'll be great. And, you mm-hmm. know, I think most of our leaders listening know this, but like 350 million would put you in the top 0.1%, mm-hmm. maybe smaller than that, of all podcasts in the world. We're in the top 1%, but you have 10x the downloads that this podcast wow. has. And we've been at it a little bit longer. 
you know, so kudos to you. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing to remember too is you're not some massive organization, right? Like, can <laughs> no. you can you talk about origin stories? Because a lot yeah. of people are like, well, if I had ten million dollars and a team of fifty, I'd have three hundred million <laughs> downloads too. But that's not your story at all, Tara Lee. Yeah, no. Um, so when we started, I was doing D Group was my full time job, mm-hmm. and the D Group team I think at that point was maybe four people something like that. And I just said, Hey, I want to start this podcast. Cause the thing is I've been doing D group at that point for 10 years. And every year I would read through the Bible chronologically. And every year I would challenge all of D group to do it with me. And people would start off strong in January, like we all do. And then they would fall off by the middle of February. And I, I, that was relatable to me because I had spent most of my life having that same problem. You know, I jokingly referred to myself as a Genesis scholar because I'd read Genesis <laughs> like a hundred times and nothing else, you know? Um, so I would challenge them to do it. And they would fall off. Well, in um, the fall, no, in, in 2018, I had a friend who uh, had asked me to answer her questions along the way. Which she wants, she was like, every year you challenge us to do this. Every year I try and I fail. Um, she was in D group. And she said, you said that the first time you ever read through scripture and like successfully completed reading through was because your pastor answered your questions along the way. And that was the only reason you succeeded. So will you do that for me? And I was like, absolutely. So every week we would go on a walk and she would ask me her questions. And sometimes she would like send me a Voxer message or a text with something during the week. And um, fall of 2018, we're on a walk and she says, I can't believe I'm about to finish the Old Testament. This never would have happened if you hadn't walked me through, uh, if you hadn't answered my questions along the way and walked me through it, like holding my hand. And so my thought was, how can I scale this to help other people in D group do the same thing? And mm-hmm. now we've got D groups on like other continents and other con- in other uh, countries and other states. And I can't have phone calls with all those people. So I thought if I just record this little podcast and send it out to D group, Um, Every week it'll, you know, like I'm planning to kind of maybe send it out in our weekly emails with our weekly videos and things like that. And um, my team were like, oh, hey, we can actually upload it to be a podcast. It's available online. It's easier. And um, so we're planning to just make it for D group. Uh, And so I'm thinking, I don't, it's going to take me like an hour a day is what I think. Mm -hmm. I think I've read through the Bible at that point 10 times. I've got a stack of notebooks uh, with notes that I've taken on all my trips through. And I'll just compile all those notes into an episode and it'll be short, you know, five to eight minutes a day, which is what it is. Um, And I'll just record it and it'll be quick and easy. So I went on Amazon and bought a $99 bundle of uh, microphone and headphones. And the box that the headset and (laughs) microphone came in, I stuffed it with a sheepskin rug. uh, And that was my studio in my kitchen in Dallas. Um, so I just recorded at night, had to record in the middle of the night cause I live downtown and it's pretty noisy. So, uh, 2 AM in Dallas, I would, I would work all day re- researching and writing the episodes. And then I would record at 2 AM, um, with the air off, uh, sticking my head in an Amazon box stuffed with a sheepskin rug. Um, that's, that's the origin that that's the, the big, uh, my studio was <laughs> um, an wow. Amazon box. But um, it just, the Lord used it, you know? Um, And I still use that same headset and microphone, Carrie. Like, I haven't updated that. Like, it's just the same thing. Yeah. Um, It's not millions of dollars in gear. It's none of that. Did you get an inflection point? Like, was it strong right out of the gate? Or was it a slow build? Or how did that work? Like, I'm thinking about traction and inflection points on the way to 350 million downloads. Yeah, I would say the thing that surprised me was it was much, I woke up on January 1st, 2019, our, the day we launched, I woke up at 10 a.m. because that's, those are the hours I keep. And um, (laughs) I woke up at 10 a.m. to 300 emails from listeners. And 300 um, emails day on launch mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Within 10 hours of the episode posting. And I was like, oh boy, this is, there are people listening. And I don't know who these people are and they're not in a D group. And so I'm not quite sure how they found us. We had done, um, I had been on Jamie Ivey's podcast to talk about it. Um, 
And she had had me on to talk about D group, but I was like, oh, I'm doing this other cool thing too. And so I didn't know that it was going to get a lot of traction. It was just kind of this casual aside conversation that we had. And um, it's funny. She had told me, do you know how hard podcasting is? And I was like, I think it'll take about an hour a day. And Carrie, <laughs> it, it derailed my, like I ended up working a hundred hours a week that year. That's honest. To build the podcast because it was so much more. And, and I think when I recognized the responsibility I had to this audience who was not just coming from, you know, with D Group, I sort of know mostly what people believe, but now we've got people who aren't even Christians who are listening. I'm getting emails from a guy in India who like is, you know, Hindu and he's got questions from what he's listening to. And so I'm trying to make it accessible to people who come from all stripes and uh, trying to sort of like major in the majors and not get on my little, um, my favorite little soapboxes about things and like not share my opinion. I need to make it palatable across the board um, because we're reaching people I never intended to reach. And um, so that was the first major inflection point was that day one. That was when I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is this is a, this is serious. I have to take this a little more seriously. I intended to take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, but you're kind of like, oh, yeah, you wake up. <laughs> even with the right? downloads I have, you're like, oh, yeah, this is a responsibility. This isn't just yeah. a hobby it started out to be. Yeah. It was, it put the fear of God in me in the best yeah. way possible. Yeah. And um, so that was one of the major things. And then um, Candace Cameron Bure had me on yep. as, so she did the Bible recap. And... Um, read through the Bible for the first time with us and um, really took a liking to it. And so when she decided to launch her podcast, she asked me to be her co-host for the first season. And so that put me out in front of her massive audience. Um, and her people are loyal. Like she, she, like they love her. And if she says do something, they will do it. And so all these people joined us because of Candace. And then, so that was another major thing. Um, also I had gotten some early on in, uh, within the first month of launching, I got publishers contacting me to want to turn it into a book. And so as soon as I finished that year of working hundred hours a week to write the podcast, I then spent three months working hundred hours a week to edit. It was, I had to edit out, I think 60% of the content, um, from the podcast transcripts to make it into a book. And still the book is like this thick. It is um, but thick. That's, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's just two pages a day. So anybody can do that, two pages. But um, that, when the book came out, that was all the more people joining us. And then we spent, uh, I think, 15 days recording all 365 episodes as videos. Um, so we just locked it down in a studio and recorded all of a year's worth of content in 15 days, turned it into a YouTube. That was another inflection point wow. and getting us out there with, you know, Gen Z and Gen Alpha. And, um, so those are things, the more, the more lanes that we try to meet people in, the more the audience grows, which is, it's been incredible. Um, and then this, another cool and unexpected thing, uh, end of 2023, the Kelsey brothers have a podcast, Travis Kelsey, Jason Kelsey, yeah. mentioned us on new, their New Heights podcast. They were like, who's this Bible recap up here? And, you know, they were number one, we were number two. And by the time their episode launched, by the time their episode loaded a couple of days after they'd recorded it, we had switched places. So we were number one and they were number two. And, um, but that, we have so many people who found us through the Kelsey brothers mentioning our podcast. They're like, I found you through New Heights. And I'm like... <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Great. Wow. Hooray. Glad you're here. You know? Yeah. So, so you and Taylor Swift, right? Competing in the same <laughs> space. There you go. Yeah. It's funny. Candace Cameron Bure and the Kelsey brothers are the two people who have driven so many people our way. And that's stuff you can't script. But you're also right. always in the discovery, the top of the charts, etc., with mm -hmm. that many downloads. And so people who are just casually scrolling often don't look down to number 178. They'll stick stick in the top 10 or 50 and you're easily discoverable. But that's that's an amazing story. And, you know, I don't know how you think about it. People say, well, even, you know, with the the amount of, of you know, downloads we have, they'll be like, how did you do it? And I'm like, I can explain it, but it's not reproducible. Like, I think if I started today, 
I'm not sure it would go the same way. I was fortunate to start in 2014. There weren't a lot, wasn't a super crowded space, et cetera. Um, do you have any we have, because I get their emails all the time, young leaders who want to do something meaningful and significant. What advice would you give them if they're looking to launch something digitally? I just had a conversation three days ago with a friend of mine and um, she has a podcast and she has big dreams for what is ahead. And it is, I think, so daunting to her because her dreams are so big. And she was like, did you ever feel this way? And I was like, honestly, no, because my dreams were very small. My dreams were very, my dreams were, uh, and, and, so when, when your goals are up here, <laughs> and like yeah. I know that this is contrary to what a lot of self-help gurus will tell you, I'm just a practical, you know, boots on the ground kind of girl. And so who, you know, works with a $99 headset microphone, you know? <laughs> so um, I, I was just like, for, for those people, I tell them, like, start where you are. Start where you are. If you want to be a Bible teacher... Are, are you teaching any classes like at your church? Like, you know, if you gather in some, some women and teaching them, um, does anybody show up? Because, and I, I can't remember if you were the person who I heard say this or not, but it was some leadership podcast. It might've been Andy Stanley, something along those lines. But um, if nobody's following you, you're not, you're not a leader. Yeah. Sounds like Andy. Mm-hmm. That's how you tell if you're a leader, right? Yeah. And so I'm and like, you, you start- had proof of concept. You had 1,200 mm-hmm people in groups, in those D groups. Yeah. And so I think um, starting where you are and serving where you are, because I find that, and I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think this is true of my friend, but I think in the modern age with the advent of influencers and social media celebrity, there is a desire to be famous for God. Um, And, you know, he who is faithful in little is faithful in much. And um, be, start where you are. Be faithful in little. Serve the Lord in that space. Don't decide. Don't despise the small beginnings. You know. Um, and I think that is that is what I tell people. Um, if you start out self publishing, or if you want to be a writer and you start out self publishing, that is fine. And that is there's nothing to be ashamed of. Like. I always just wanted my ministry to serve the people that God wanted it to serve. And I was not out trying to, you know, build an audience. Um, I think we bought maybe $800 worth of ads on one podcast. That was the only advertising mm. that we did. And um, and we did that the, before the first year. We haven't done anything since. And so um, it has been just a real, like, uh, joy to see how the Lord has grown it. And I think... It, I'm so grateful that he kept me from a space of wanting to achieve fame um, because then that, I don't think I would have liked the way my heart looked. Um, and I, he didn't have to rob me of any entitlement in those spaces um, because I came in just going, I would like to serve these 300 people, you know? <laughs> like yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Well, let me, let me add a few hundred million to that number, yeah. you know? I think that is such good advice because, yeah, I, th- I really liked what you said about dreams versus reality. I mean, I'm the same way. I never, if you would have told me, you'll be doing this a decade down the road, you'll have 35 million downloads. I'd be like, mm, crazy. No way, man. Uh, it, it was incon- inconceivable. Same with the church in the early days. But I don't know that this is still true. Uh, but you're definitely, you know, a next gen leader. And so I'd love to pick your brain on it. I find most of the people who turn out to have big success did not set out. And I, I put success in brackets because who knows what that really is. God knows the heart, right? But let's say, mm-hmm. let's say a good size platform. Um, they never set out to create a good size platform. They set out to do meaningful work and the platform kind of took care of itself. Would you say that's still true? Is that an antiquated uh, understanding? What's your take on that? I would say if you take the long view, that is still true. I think there are people that we see who um, maybe have success in the short term. And then if, because, and and I think I've heard you talk about this, the character development that comes in the, in the long arc of success 
is so mm-hmm. important. If you skyrocket to success and you haven't had time to have your character develop in accordance with that, you're probably maybe bound for ruin. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you shoot to success and then you like that, is that success or no? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, I think we'll see more and more of that. And I think, um, I don't wish that on anybody. I think the the long arc is the healthier arc. And I think you're right. I think you can hack the algorithm. You can definitely skyrocket yourself to fame. But that whole character versus competency, the size of your character versus the size of your platform, Mm -hmm. I've said it here before, I shudder to think what would have happened to me in my 30s if this had happened to me in my 30s, you know, in my late 50s. I can sort of just handle it, honestly, terribly. <laughs> like, I'm like, all right, I'm still in development, okay? And I haven't mm-hmm. made any major mistakes that I'm aware of so far. <laughs> but I'd love to ask you, if you don't mind, and, and answer to the level that you're comfortable. What has the last five years, how has your character been tested with the growth of the platform? Because that's a very observant comment you made. Mm. Um. Certainly, there are opportunities to to compromise and um, just uh, so I'm a single person. And um, what's interesting, and this is just I'll just speak freely. um, My position does not make me desirable to Christian men. Um, Interestingly, my position makes me very desirable to ungodly men. Um. And I think it is, I don't know, I don't know what that is. Like some people are like, oh, it's intimidation. Oh, it's, I have no, I don't know. And, and it's not mine to figure out. I don't need to figure that out. So Christian um, men are not, like they feel intimidated? Or I don't uh, know what they feel, but okay. um, maybe, maybe they do. Maybe. I don't know. Um, no, you're not the is, first young single woman to tell me that. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. if you're really pursuing God with a whole heart, it's a turn off to Christian men. Mm-hmm. What is it? You're right. too strong. You're too successful. I don't, wow. I don't really know. And there's, there's also a, I think success is often I actually had a, I was on a date not long ago and I was telling the guy like, I know all I've, you know, I've so many amazing single female friends. They're beautiful. They're intelligent. They're funny. They're kind, they're successful. And he stopped me and he said, men don't actually care if women are successful. I, and and you know, I know he doesn't speak for all men, but that's what he said. He said, men don't actually care if women are successful. And so I was like, oh, I actually think you might be right. And like, or at least in my experience, I know men who don't care. And I'm sure there are men who do care um, that that is a value to them. Um, but this man was saying he did not think most men that he knows um, aren't interested in that. And so what I find, to get back to your original question, is that um, typically I am more pursued by men who don't love the Lord. And, um, so, uh, that presents the opportunity for me to compromise. Fortunately, that is not desirable to me at all. (laughs) Fortunately, (laughs) fortunately, I don't find myself at all attracted to men who don't love the Lord. And so that is not so much, um, but I can see how the enemy might use that. That could be a, uh, a weakness that like, I don't ever want to assume that I wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't be a stumbling block for me. It hasn't been, um, but I would, you know, be careful lest you stumble, you know, if you think you're standing firm. And so um, that's one of the things. And then I think also there's just the, um, I think the natural people who are in fast paced, busy lives can find themselves growing in entitlement and arrogance without even noticing it. And so when you start to be treated as though you matter more than other people, you might start to internalize that. And so what I have tried to do is I make, I make spiritual goals for myself every year. And one of my spiritual goals this year is to, and this is going to sound maybe ridiculous, is to let every single person merge who needs to merge. <laughs> That's a great goal. You mean in traffic. And it's, It's so subtle. It's so Uh, subtle, but especially in Dallas traffic, anytime, because that whole, like, you're not going to merge. That's this entitlement, this, I'm the king of the road. It's this arrogance. And every day I'm presented with multiple opportunities to die to self, to consider others more important than myself and to just let them merge. And, and so that is just one of the ways that the Lord has prompted me 
to make sure that I don't take myself too seriously, that I don't think I'm more important than other people. And just those little things um, I think are really helpful. I also, it really helps me that I have an incredible team around me who not only knows and loves me uh, like like as a coworker, but a lot of them are my, they're my friends. And so they, it's really important to me. There was a girl that I, I wanted to hire for a position and I was like, I, I literally told a friend this yesterday. I said, I don't want to hire her because she's afraid of me. She won't tell me no. And I don't mean afraid of me like I'm going to yell at her. I mean, she yeah, yeah. she just, she, she always would defer to me. And I have a team around me who's like, I don't think that's the best idea. I don't think that's the way we should go. And that's, man, I need that. And it's so good. And so surrounding myself with people who have great ideas, who are really talented, who have really strong character and who um, have the mission as the main thing and not like exalting Tara Lee as the main thing. Um, it's we're on mission to help people read, understand, and love God's word. We do it through D group. We do it through the Bible recap. We do it through Israel Lux, our tours to Israel. We do it through the God shot, our radio show. Everything that we do is to help people read, understand, and love God's word. And that matters more to them than, you know, being a yes man to me. You're very wise to realize at this stage that the bigger the platform, the harder it is to get people to tell you the truth. And I can think of a handful of leaders who that probably was their downfall. Mm-hmm. You know, we quoted Andy already, but he says, you know, leaders who refuse to listen will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. There's a lot to do that. Acuff, John Acuff has a variation of that. He says, leaders who refuse to be questioned end up doing questionable things. And I think both of those are true. What I want to know, you know, as a young leader yourself with this rapid growth over the last five years, what was it that made you sensitive to that dynamic that I need people to tell me the truth? I need people who will challenge me. I need people who will tell me Mm -hmm. I'm wrong because... Leaders tend to, you can assemble an entourage that just basically affirms everything you Mm -hmm. want and gives you whatever you want. They indulge you. So how did you, what was in you to make you realize, I think I need to resist that? I think a couple of things. Um, Fortunately, the Holy Spirit (laughs) (laughs) uh, is, um, the Holy Spirit is great at reminding me that I'm a sinner. You know, yes, I'm a saint. I'm also a sinner. And um, that's the tension of living in the already and not yet, you know? Um, And so uh, one of the things I love, because with the Bible recap, we read through the Bible chronologically. And so we've talked about it a lot, but like the idea is we read through the Bible chronologically. You do your like 12-ish minutes of reading a day, which is about three-ish chapters of the Bible. And then you can listen to my podcast for eight minutes where I explain what you just read and how it fits in the overall meta narrative, the chronological storyline of scripture. Um, or two pages a day if it's the book. And what you find when you read through chronologically, the Apostle Paul, uh, he starts out when he's talking about himself to groups of people, he's like, Paul, an apostle. And then, you know, later, Paul, the least of the apostles. And then Mm. later, Paul, a sinner. And then later, Paul, the chief of sinners. The further he gets along in his walk with the Lord, the more he recognizes his own depravity. And so fortunately, I I, I met the Lord when I was about four years old, um, and the Holy Spirit, I believe, came and and lived with me at that moment and lived in me at that moment and began a journey of sanctification and making me aware of my own sin. Um, One of the things He does is remind us who we are. And so that course correction that comes when you walk with the Holy Spirit, He's doing that in me. He's reminding me of my own depravity, and not in a way that shames me. Uh, but in a way that redirects me, he reminds me of my identity in Christ. He's like, hey, this thing that you're doing, that's not who you are. Let's let's go do something different. Here, I'll help. You know, um, that's incredible. The other thing that has really helped is I'm the youngest of six kids. And my, my oldest siblings are, uh, my two oldest siblings, uh, I don't think I even ever lived in the house with them. They were significantly older than me. And I was far enough behind to watch what they did and how that worked out for them, um, to be able to see the long arc of their life. And so I sort of grew up making a a habit of that and watching, oh, here's this pastor. He's kind of gotten very popular. Wonder what's going to happen there. 
uh, oh, here's this, this writer, this worship artist, this whatever, like, how's that going to go? And so watching the long arc of other people's lives, um, I certainly have mistakes of my own, but I would much rather learn from other people's mistakes. That is a very interesting thing. I had, uh, not so much in the church world, but in the legal world, you know, the five years I spent in law between studying and working downtown and getting called to the bar, I felt like God showed me the top. And when I saw the top and I saw how empty it was, money, prestige, misery, all of that, I'm like, oh, this is easy to walk away from or easy not to get ensnared by. What do you think it is that made you as a young woman see that early? Because a lot of people, well, some people never get that insight. Some people get it in their 40s or 50s. You got it really young. Any idea what contributed to that? Because that's a gift. I think the the lives of those people who come tumbling down, if you watch the decisions that they make, um, it's not always evident right away. But if, if you have uh, discernment and you look and you see the way they treat the people around them, the way they take leverage for themselves, maybe where it's not warranted. You know, Jesus talked about taking the lower position at the table instead of the higher position at the table. And people who want to take the higher position, um, I think those are signals of what's happening internally. That those are signals about the direction that people are headed. And now all of us are given to selfishness and all of us are given to those things at times. And so I'm not talking about a one-off. I'm talking about a trajectory. And if you see a trajectory of selfishness, lack of concern for others, um, taking advantage of situations. I think those are things that let you know the trajectory that someone is on. And um, that was something that just watching the long arc of people's lives. And that I think that's something that even not even in leadership, but when I'm looking for a friend, I had a, a girl who everybody thought we would be great friends and I spent time with her and all she did was gossip. And I just thought, I don't want to, this is not a person I want to invite near to me. I don't want to hear all these other people's stuff. And I don't want to know what you're sharing about me behind my back. And so those are just things you just have to pay attention. Pay attention, use wisdom, use discernment. The Holy Spirit gifts us with those things. Um, and it's one of the things I love about, <laughs> in, in James 1.5, God promises wisdom to all who ask. And so I ask for that every single day, every single day. I have so much to learn. I need so much wisdom. And so I'm always asking him for that. And he gives it. And I'm grateful. So you casually mentioned 100-hour work weeks. So, <laughs> you know, just kind of like threw that in there. I want to go back to it. What are you learning? First of all, how did you endure a year or 18 months of 100-hour work weeks? And what are you learning about a sustainable pace? Because you're right. Anybody who thinks podcasting mm. is easy, I would say I have the much easier format. I prepare for an interview. Uh, I do a little bit of the work. The guest does most of the work. Uh, you have to deliver. So I'd love to, although we are going to get into some solo episodes later this year, by the way. But well, anyway. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, <laughs> yeah. So how, I... how do you manage the workload? Okay, that year was, it was so hard, Carrie. It was so hard. I, I, first of all, one of the things that I did first was I contacted the people who were close to me in my life. I had selected five of them that I was allowed to spend time with that year. And everybody else had to get a no. But I told those five people, I have to see you every week because I'm just, I, I would spend several days in a row not leaving my apartment. I would wake up in my pajamas, sit at my dining room table with my stack of commentaries and my 47 open tabs and my study Bibles. And I would research and I would write. And in the middle of the night, I would record and everything had to get sidelined. But I knew, I know I don't do well in isolation and I live alone. I'm single. Uh, I don't have any pets. And so I'm like, I have to have socialization or I'm not going to be emotionally healthy. And I have to be emotionally healthy and in order to do this very important spiritual work. And so I gathered friends around me that I had to see every week. 
And, and I told them, I'm not going to have anything interesting to talk about. I just need you to talk to because I'll, I'm just, <laughs> I am, this is, if you want to talk about, you know, maybe uh, like the Maccabean revolt, I can, we can talk about that. Can you know, you. like, mm-hmm. they, right. Um, but things like that, I, I was just like, I don't have any social life. Uh, I'm not going on any dates. I don't have anything. And so that was, that was a year for me and it was very lonely and it was very hard. And I developed all kinds of, I mean, I developed a lot of physical symptoms that went away afterward. I got vertigo. I started losing my vision. I got carpal tunnel. Um, I got shingles, like all these things. My health was breaking down. Um, it was really hard year and it was the most fruitful work I've ever done. And someone compared it. Now, I've, I've, like I said, not married, don't have any children. Someone compared it to what it's like when you have a baby and you just, you aren't sleeping and you aren't taking care of yourself and your body's falling apart. And, but you have to like grow this thing. Like you have to keep this thing alive and this gets priority over everything else. And so, you know, there was a, a woman I'd never met who I, um, she, I, she'd heard me mention on a podcast, I think that I worked hundred hours a week and she sent me an email rebuking me like, God, God never intended for anybody to work that hard. And I was kind of like, I don't know that I agree with that. Um, it's a season. Mm. It's a season. It's not my life. It's a season. Just like when you're, you know, when you have a baby and, um, so for me, I, I don't ever want to go back to that. It's not a healthy, sustainable pace. I have, fortunately, I have a team that really values my mental, emotional, physical health, and they want to make sure that that stays on track. Because another thing we, we haven't even touched on is I did, um, I, I had to take a sabbatical where I stepped away for three months. My team asked me to do that. Um, actually, one of my board members, we're not a nonprofit, but I, have a, a, I want to have a prayer and advisory board anyway. So I gather some people around us who pray and advise. And one of our board members said, I think you need a three month sabbatical minimum immediately. And so I went to my team and I said, here's what board member says. And they were like, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And during that, I went and got a lot of therapy. Um, and I did EMDR, which was amazing. Oh, I I've, did, I've, I've got people I know well who've done EMDR. It was helpful for you? So helpful. What does that then, stand for? Pardon my ignorance. Maybe you don't know either. Yeah, it's just it, known as it EMDR. Stands for, it stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. There you go. And... Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's basically the, the, what it does. I did not do the eye movement kind. I did a kind where you hold these little paddles in your hand that like vibrate alternately, okay. but basically it's a way to trick your brain into engaging both hemispheres, um, with each other because they, the hemispheres don't communicate much and trauma is stored in one side of the brain and logic and reasoning are stored in the other side. And so you, you got to get them to talk. Um, so that's what that did. It helped with some PTSD. Um, and then my, the, the man who administered my EMDR, my therapist, um, suggested I try something that he did not do, um, that you have to go to a, a specialist for called neurofeedback. And I did 78 sessions of neurofeedback. And that was a game changer. Um, because this is one of the, one of the ironies of, um, the way my brain worked before I had neurofeedback was that I'd never got tired. Um, my, the part of my brain that's supposed to tell you to fall asleep or stay asleep was not functioning. And so wow. I can Hence stay up and work. Podcasts. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And I would, I had to take tons of medication to even sleep three hours a night. And so that's how I existed for years. And then my body started breaking down because your body's not meant to sleep three hours a night. And I could do that without caffeine. Like it didn't take caffeine to keep me awake. Um, now I like caffeine and I did use caffeine to power through. But um, even when I took caffeine hiatuses, um, hi- hiati? I don't know what the yeah. plural of hiatus yeah, is. Yeah, that probably um, would be <laughs> hiati, but I get it. I get it. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, I needed this space away from work to prioritize my mental health and to get my brain fixed. And um, so I did. And I sleep eight hours a night now. And it's amazing. Um, so what, what is fantastic. that therapy called? Neuro? Neurofeedback. Mm-hmm. And wh- can you give us an overview of what happens in neurofeedback? That's a new term to me. Yeah. it's uh, So I wore this little brain cap and they do a brain scan. 
and they show you this color-coded chart um, from red to dark blue. And the, the brain is color-coded accordingly, the, the little regions of the brain. Red is overactive, like highly overactive. Then there's orange, which is slightly overactive. Then yellow, mildly overactive. Green is healthy. And then these varying shades of blue that get progressively darker that are like levels of inactivity. And dark blue, like cobalt blue, is like basically dormant. So as we're looking at my brain scan, the areas of my brain that were bright red were PTSD, depression, anxiety, rumination. Um, And the parts of my brain that were dark blue were uh, the parts of my brain that tell me to go asleep and fall asleep and stay asleep. And so, (laughs) right, I was basically living my life in fight or flight constantly. And that's why I never got tired. So... Uh, you go in after you get your brain scanned, you go in and they, you wear another skull cap and you watch this video. This was the kind of neurofeedback that I did. Um, you watch a little video and you have to focus on the video. And uh, as you focus on the video, mine was just a green field. And if I'm focusing, flowers would bloom and trees would grow. And if I stop focusing, all that would fade away because the video is like, it's connected somehow to the, the cap that you're wearing. And there's a, there's a therapist administering all this and watching. And if my brain would wander, she would be like, okay, focus. And what's so cool, Carrie, I love, one of the things that was really cool was when I began to meditate, as I'm watching this video, I began to meditate on scripture and meditate on, you know, God says what, whatsoever things are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. And when I began to think about the word of God and the things in my life that were true, noble, admirable, when I began to think those things, the trees would grow and the flowers would bloom and I would make progress. And if I started to ruminate and have a negative thought and get in this negative thought cycle, everything would go fade to gray. And I, my, the, the woman who administered my neurofeedback not a believer. I got to talk to her about the Lord. She had to sit and listen to me talk for, you know, an hour for 78 sessions. Um, So she heard me talk about the Lord a lot. But I watched the words of God and my focus on the words of God transform my brain through this process. Whoa! And it was, I mean, it, it just, it changed my life. Changed my life. My goodness. I'm just taking yeah. a few notes. That I've never heard of that. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so there's sort yeah. of a before and after. Mm-hmm. Man, time's moving and one on. Of the, yeah, yeah, keep going. One of the other aspects of that, and this is just a sidebar, um, but I, whenever I was building the Bible Recap in 2019, and then I finished editing into a book uh, March 1st, 2020, and I was like, great, I get to go back into the world again. No. Uh, <laughs> COVID hit, you know, like yes. two weeks oh, later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, then I came back into my apartment by myself again for another year. Um, and I'm, I'm very, uh, immunocompromised because I've had two open heart surgeries and was electrocuted in one of those. And so my lungs and my heart are both compromised. So I did not want to catch anything. And, um, so I stayed in and I wrote, I think five, five more books. I wrote six books in 2020. And, um, then, you know, the masks come out, I go back into the world again. And all of a sudden I'm in this space where I'm Christian famous. And it was terrifying for me. I did not want to leave my house. I did not want to meet strangers. I did, and, and I didn't recognize myself because I love people. Are you getting people, stopped I, like in restaurants? Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, I do want to meet those people. I do want to say hi to them. I, like It is the honor of my life that I get to read through the Bible with them. But I was terrified of them. And I would show up 20 minutes late to church and I would leave 20 minutes early and I would make sure I got to sit between two friends so I didn't have to talk to anybody. And I didn't recognize myself. And so when I went for EMDR and I went to neurofeedback and I got myself back, I got back the part of me that's not afraid of the world. I got back the part of me that can, you know, I got got the part of me that can sleep for the first time ever. And um, it made me a better minister of the gospel. It made me able to love people better and not be so afraid and and in my own skin and not fixated on myself and what I was afraid of. It, the Lord uh, used that tool. And here's what I love. This, this makes me so excited. Like this is the generosity of God that this tool is available even for people who don't know and love him, even for people who don't believe he created their brain. And I believe he created, yes, Mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Like how generous is God? 
that he created this tool to heal the brains of people who will, you know, uh, someday will bow a knee and confess him as Lord. Uh, but not now, you know, um, how generous. Yeah. Yeah, man. I have so many questions for you because this is a <laughs> this powerful interview took story. a turn. We weren't hey, planning on this. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't looked at my questions. These are the best interviews. Okay. This mm, is great. Yeah. Well, thank you for being so open and transparent. <laughs> I think, I think there can be a sense in which we think I need to have my life completely put together before mm-hmm. I launch something and God uses it. On the other hand, there are other people who we've seen, no names, bleed in public. It's like, whoa, they're so not put together and they're mm-hmm. not helping anybody. They're just emoting or they're, right. they're, they're falling apart online You seem to have found a balance because, you know, I've read your stuff and I do want to ask this question before we wrap up. It's substantial. It's not like today I saw a bird and the bird reminded me of God's love. There's your devotion for today, right? Right. I mean, there's, there's enough of those out there in the world. You, you're the opposite of that. You have meat. We'll get to that. Um, Any thoughts on, cause you know, I look back on my thirties, which is your decade right now, I think. And I was a bit of a mess and God used me powerfully. And then he broke me and spent a lot of time healing and rebuilding my early forties. And in the last 15 years have been, well, last decade has been the best year decade of my life. And in many ways, both personally for the people who actually know me and who are in my life. And then, you know, with all the other stuff too. Um, But it's really a mystery. And so I'm just thinking, you know, it's easy on the outside looking in saying, okay, Tara Lee doesn't have any problems. You've got your challenges too. Is there a line or where is the line between, yeah, I'm going through this stuff and I'm able to do ministry versus, no, I should probably wait or step back. I'm not talking about a sabbatical. It's just like Mm -hmm. a a no-go. Do you have any thoughts on that? Wow, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to the question, but my job is to ask them, Tara Lee, so... (laughs) There you go. I, yeah, I think I have been very grateful to have wise people around me who I can take those questions to. And I just, I don't live in the dark, Carrie. I think that's step number one is I don't live in the dark. I make decisions by committee. Even my team is, ve- we're very communal in our decisions. And so even though I'm the boss and I have the final say, people speak into things and I don't always get my way. And um, I think that's important. I shouldn't always get my way. I don't want to be that kind of boss. I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't always get my way either. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so um, I think having people around you who know you, love you, uh, and can speak into your life, those people will help you see when you can't see. And um, that has always been so valuable to me. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. The people who, you know, that pastor who said, hey, let's let's do a sabbatical, you know? Um, I couldn't see that. Couldn't see it. And um, I just knew that I was terrified all the time. And I was starting to get angry. And I'm not an angry person. And so I was like, something's going on inside. I can't, I don't know what's happening. And um, they can articulate it for me. And they can point out those things that I can't see, those blind spots. Um, the first thing my dad has us do, you know, this started when I was a kid. Anytime we get a, another car, go and buy those dollar blind spot mirrors mm. at like AutoZone and, and put them on the side view mirrors. The concave and, or convex. I still mm-hmm, haven't figured yep, out which mm-hmm, is which. But, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, anytime I'm driving a rental car, they don't have them on them. And I'm like, this is horrible. How do people drive like this? You can't see your blind spots. And that's how I would feel in my life if I did not have people on my team and in my life regularly. And the thing is, you, you've you got to bring your stuff out. into. You can't keep your stuff stuffed in a corner and expect people to accurately hold you accountable or give you wise advice for your life. You have to drag the sin out into the dark, throw some light on it, stop being afraid of who you really are. Show who you really are to people because that's how they can love you. They can't love you if you're faking it. That's how they can guide you. They can't guide you if you're giving them false information and they got to know where you really are. If you, if your GPS can't pinpoint where you are, you can't get directions to where you're going. And so those I think are the vital things in making sure we don't 
um, disqualify ourselves from ministry, that we don't become so much of a jerk that no one wants to be around us, that we don't run our ministry into the ground. And I feel like I've got to offer this one caveat because this has happened to me. There have been people in my life who thought they knew me and who thought they understood my motive and they have tried to speak into my life and they have been wrong. Mm -hmm. And so not everyone who speaks into your life, who means well and says they love you and loves the Lord, not everyone is going to be right. The Holy Spirit will help you know. Well, you've got great discernment. Um, You know, that wise counsel, I have enough reformed in me and my background to know that wisdom is confirmed in the council around you and God's call is confirmed in the council around you. And that really sounds like you've done a great job figuring that out. Um, I remember your talk, back to where we started. <laughs> Last question I've got for you. This is 2019, mm-hmm. talking about the next generation. And you're like, they mm-hmm. want meat. I forget whether it was we want meat, they want meat. That was feed the refrain. Steak. Feed them steak, feed them steak. Mm-hmm. They want yeah. steak, feed them steak. Mm-hmm. One thing that characterizes your work is there's no fluff. In those eight minutes, in those two pages, there's no fluff. Like, I did go to seminary. There's a lot more fluff in seminary. Okay, I've read a lot of commentaries. <laughs> All right. You, you do a great job of just equipping people. And I would love to know, obviously, it's resonating with, with, with millions and millions of people. So we know that. Mm-hmm. A lot of young people. Is it a lot of next gen who are listening, mm-hmm. or do you have a broad it's, audience? Listen, we have everything from five to eighty-five. That's truly, right. yeah, yeah. So that's resonating. I'd love to know a little bit about your research. You do have a team, which you're mm-hmm. blessed, but I mean, the way you carry those threads from day to day, three hundred and sixty-five mm-hmm. times. I mean, to write a meaty devotion on one passage, great. We can all do that. <laughs> Pretty sure we can figure that out. Do it 365 times and then refresh it for the future is is uh, a world-class skill. I would love mm. for you to break that down a little bit. I used a lot. First of all, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in the church. Um, I, I, I became a Christian at four. My family owns a Christian bookstore. That was my first job. And so I grew up in the aisles surrounded by all those books and commentaries and Strong's Concordance that, you know, weighed more than me. And um, so I have access to all these tools. I know how to use these tools. I know how to use a Greek and Hebrew lexicon, even though I don't speak Greek and Hebrew. And we live in the, in the, in the most scripture-saturated society in the history of the universe. We have access to the best teaching. We have access to—it's all at our fingertips. And so I poured over— so many of those things. Um, as I tried to research every day, um, this was my team did not help me research. So this was my stacks of journals from my ten years through Scripture, um, my stacks of sermon notes from a lifetime in church, um, and then all the research I could cram in. And here was one of the things that was important to me, Carrie, um, especially as I discovered that our audience uh, was wide. And my goal is to keep these people in the Word because. They're in the Word. The Holy Spirit can illuminate the things that they need to learn, and I don't need to insert my opinion. And so I'm very disinterested in my own opinion. What I want to do is I want to scream where Scripture screams and whisper where Scripture whispers. I don't want to scream where Scripture whispers. Mm -hmm. And so in (laughs) passages like baptism, I have a view. I have a a very informed view of, of baptism and my opinion. And I wanted to make sure that not a single listener knew what my opinion was. So what I said was I had like, here are the the primary views on baptism. This view, this view, this view, this view. And I went to friends of mine who were pastors and I said, tell me everything about your view, like support it biblically, historically, whatever. And I'm going to write this out to explain what you just said for this episode. And I want you to see if it's represented. And um, I did that until I got them all right. And then I had them read, I had all those pastors read all those views to see if they could tell which one was mine, because I wanted to, to muddy my view um, and, and not have it be discernible. And so that was really important to me in that process. And that took so much work mm-hmm. to hide my opinions. And then there are places where my opinion changes a lot. Like, I mean, you want to talk about eschatology? People are like, what's your view on eschatology? And I'm like, whatever book I read, ra- read last, like that's right, the one I... Right. The, Am I in that's Daniel, the one I Revelation read. or <laughs> right. the end of the Gospels? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I just, uh, I know, uh, I, I've been a Christian for all but four years of my life. And I've seen my opinions change on a lot of things. 
And so I'm not willing to alienate a listener over something that I might change my opinion on next week. That's just foolishness. And so I want to just present the text and clarify the text to them. So that was a lot of the work was trying to extract myself. And so now, you know, by the grace of God, we have these incredible listeners who will come to me and say, this, the way you said this was a little, uh, felt a little murky. Can you clarify this? And I'll go, you're right. Let's clarify that. Let me edit that so that next year when we go through this, the way I say that is clearer. Um, and I love that. I'm happy to edit those things. Or when I learn something new, I just sat this past weekend, Carrie, I just sat under some of the best teaching I have ever heard in my life. I wept. I have wept several times since I left that church. And uh, it was a church in San Diego. I was out there for a wedding. And I just, I like want to go to the episodes of the Bible recap where we touch the passages that this pastor taught on and like just beef it up with all this. It's just, when I learn new stuff, I'm like, I got to put this in there because I got to help the people learn more. And so we have, you know, we do the same reading plan every year, but every year there's new and exciting stuff in there. And every year you're a different person when you're reading the Bible. New things are going to jump out at you. The Holy Spirit's going to illuminate the text. It's living and active. And so we have people who, it's our sixth year doing the program. And we have people who are doing it over with us again. And I am still learning new things all the time. Praise God. Because I'm going to be reading it every day till I'm in the ground. And I don't want it to get boring. I don't like to be bored. I want to keep learning new stuff. <laughs> so every day is a treasure hunt. You know, it's great. Well, I'm suspecting this is there's a round two coming up at some point down the road <laughs> because we barely scratched the surface. But this has been really, really great. I'd love to give you the final word. Is there anything you want to comment on, say, challenge the audience with before we wrap up? You know, um, I would I would love to encourage them to read through the Bible with me. I would love, if you are a church leader, I would love to be a church partner with you for D Group, our, our Bible studies, or for the Bible Recap. We we partner with churches for that. But but the main thing, like a few minutes ago, Carrie, the, I felt like the Lord was like, "Hey, will you pray for His audience?" And so, if that's okay, I would just love to pray a blessing over you and, and your team and your church and your audience and every listener and viewer right now. Um, so. I will receive that. Please. All right. Thank you. Father, what a gift to be able to come to you in the name of your son, Jesus, um, by the sacrifice that he made on the cross, by his death, resurrection, and ascension. The fact that I get to call you father, to approach the throne of grace with confidence. What a gift to be your daughter. I just want to thank you for this time with Carrie today, um, the conversation that we've had. And, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the way that you've directed this conversation. Thank you for just the, the little nudge, maybe, to, to have this prayer. Um, I believe that there are church leaders and future church leaders and, and even past church leaders who are listening to this conversation right now and that you are moving in their heart, directing their steps. Um, I pray that you would encourage them in the right ways, that you would guide them, whether it's guiding them toward repentance, whether it's directing their steps for ministry, whether it is um, pointing them toward a reconciliation of a a, a relationship gone wrong, uh, that you are there in in the heart of, of everyone who belongs to you, prompting them and guiding them and leading them, Holy Spirit. And so I pray that you would show up in ways that are uh, Mark-specific and Regina-specific and Cheryl-specific and Stephen-specific to direct them. And may you be glorified in the outcome. And Father, I pray a blessing over Carrie and his team and his church and his family. Would you continue to equip them as they move forward to advance the kingdom? Be glorified. We love you too. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank so, you. Anywhere you get podcasts, you can find the Bible recap. The book is mm-hmm. by the same name. And is there sort of a gateway for everything, Tara Lee? Yeah. The Bible recap.com or Tara Lee Cobble.com. Probably going to be easier to spell the Bible recap than to spell <laughs> Tara Lee Cobble. So uh, you can find me through the Bible recap. It's been a joy. Thank you. Likewise.